Now we move on to optical sources. So we want to design the optical transmitter so that information can get encoded in either as 1s and 0s uh, as multiple amplitudes or as multiple phases or as a combination of amplitude and phases. So the question we have to ask ourselves is what are the critical parameters that we now need to worry about? If I am picking a source, what are the parameters of the source that the, the optical source that I need to look at? I have a lot of information, lot of data sheets of different LEDs, different laser diodes. What would the parameters that what are the parameters that I should look for? Wavelength, because depending on the wavelength, the attenuation is different. So you would look for wavelength, okay? Emission wavelength, okay? You would look for how much power is transmitted, how much power is available, speed, how fast can you do your modulation? What else? So modulation bandwidth. line width. Uh, at the moment it is not very clear why we should do worry about line width but we will put that the carrier width. It may not may or may not be important. Noise, what kind of noise? Ampli so line width is actually phase noise. We will talk about this again later but line width is phase noise and you also have to worry about Amplitude noise, is the source itself noisy? So the sum of the parameters that you need to look at are emission wavelength, what is the width of the spectral width? Is it a broadband emitter? Is it a narrow band emitter? Is it a tunable emitter? If you want to put different, so we talked about passband modulation. In principle, I could have multiple carrier frequencies FC1, FC2, FC3, etc. Is the same source able to give me all these frequencies as and when I desire? Right? So that is another consideration I need to, or should I use different sources? Okay? So that is the spectral width. Modulation, uh, we talked about modulation. It is not just the speed, it should have the ability to do amplitude modulation and phase modulation. The source ability to couple into a fiber, LED is a source which is emitting light, but you should have the ability to put that light into the fiber. Right? So the emission features, the, uh, whether it is, uh, what is what, the uh, angle of divergence from the source? Can I easily couple it into a fiber? That is an important parameter. Of course, power you said, we should also worry about power, not just the power emitted by the, but the energy consumption of the source itself and efficiency. How much of electrical power am I using to get unit optical power? So in general, wall plug efficiency of the laser source, that is also an important parameter. Because overall in a communication system, you want to keep the power consumed as low as possible. So the possible sources are LEDs and laser diodes and optical communication system became a big success commercially only because semiconductors, semiconductor sources were available which were compact, reliable, cost effective. Only these, it, so in addition to having, you may find several sources which may have all these features, but if you want to deploy it commercially, you also need the most important, these last parameters. And because semiconductor LEDs and semiconductor uh, light sources were available, which were reliable, uh, which had a long lifetime, which could be deployed very easily, which were very compact, which were energy efficient. That is how optical communication became a commercial success. Okay? So the next thing is to now look at what are the basic working principles of semiconductor sources.
okay so this comes from your 12th standard understanding of 12 semiconductor devices we don't need anything more than that for this light matter interaction in semiconductors so this th gives you the energy level diagram ek diagram the x axis is momentum right uh, for a semiconductor you have what is called as a conduction band where you will have electrons and you have valence band where you can find holes now whenever there is light falling into the semiconductor or photon can be absorbed generating an electron hole pair leaving a hole in the valence band electron in the conduction band so that is absorption the energy of this photon that is emitted must be equal to e2 minus e1 where e2 is the energy occupied by the electron in the conduction band e1 is energy occupied by the hole in the valence band and of course we know the definition of band gap it is the difference in energy levels between the lowest energy in the conduction band to the highest energy in the band, uh, valence band and you also know this concept of direct band gap where the momentum corresponding to the lowest energy in the conduction band and the highest energy in the va valence band are same that is your direct band gap. You could have indirect band gap materials which are like this, valence band is like this, conduction band is like this, valence band is this. But we are not talking about indirect band gap materials as far as emission is concerned. Now what is emission? If I already have an electron occupied in the uh, conduction band and a hole in the valence band, there could be a recombination between the electron and the hole and as a result of the recombination the energy is released and that energy is again given by E2 minus E1. So there could be an absorption process or there could be an emission process. How do I create this electron extra electron in the conduction band and the hole in the valence band so that there is an emission? I need to inject additional carriers. So if I do carrier injection into the system. A practical way of doing carrier injection is send current through a forward biased p-n junction diode. Take a p-n junction diode, send current through it, you are injecting carriers and when you are inject injecting carriers, you are creating excess carriers in the conduction band, uh, uh, excess electrons in the conduction band and excess holes in the valence band. So they can recombine giving rise to a photon which whose energy is given by E2 minus E1. In, you could also have a situation where you have injected, you have created excess electrons in the conduction band and correspondingly hold in the valence band. And now if you have a photon that is incident in the system, whose energy is equal to E2 minus E1, then you could also initiate emission because of this photon and that process is your stimulated emission. Okay. So you could have spontaneous emission where we discussed earlier where you have spontaneous means on its own without requiring external stimulation. So depending on the lifetimes of the electrons in the excited state, you could have the electrons and the hole recombining and that is your spontaneous emission phenomena. You could also have stimulated emission where an external photon is initiating the electron hole recombination. So all these processes can happen in the semiconductor. You could have absorption, you could have spontaneous emission, you could have stimulated emission. An absorption process takes in a photon and generates electron hole pair. A sp spontaneous emission process takes in injection current and generates photons. A stimulated process takes an injection current, creates this excess carriers, takes in a photon and generates more number of photons. Okay. So you could, in all these processes, you need to conserve energy, you need to conserve momentum. So it is not just the, uh, the y axis, you have to worry about the x axis also. Uh, photo detectors work based on absorption because you are getting photon and you are generating electron hole pair 
if we can extract that electron out into an electrical circuit that is a measure of the number of photons that is incident in the system. So, that is how you will use this absorption process to make a photodetector work. LEDs work based on spontaneous emission. You are sending a current, there is an emission that happens in the system and that light you are extracting out. If you send the current in an on off fashion, the light also comes out in an on off fashion and that is your on off keyed signal generated from a direct modulation LED. Whereas, laser diodes work based on stimulated emission. We will talk more about that when we are talking about laser diodes. But one thing to remember is that whether it is spontaneous emission or stimulated emission, in order to have emission, you need to have excess carriers, which means that you need to have what is called as a population inversion or you need to have electrons in the conduction, excess electrons in the conduction band and corresponding holes in the valence band. Okay. So, how do you create this population inversion? As I told you earlier, you send in a drive current, forward bias drive current and that is sufficient enough. The carriers occupy the conduction band leaving holes in the valence band and so you can create a population inversion. So, how does one make an LED emit? You take a PN junction diode, forward bias it so that you are allowing the carriers to move through your depletion region. That is good enough for the other thing is between spontaneous emission and stimulated emission is in case of spontaneous emission, the electron hole recombinations that are happening are at random, which means that there is no phase relation between a specific recombination and another recombination. All of them are happening randomly, which means the photons are emitted at different phases. Whereas, if you are doing a stimulated emission, one photon can stimulate the emission of or recombination of multiple photons simultaneously resulting in the fact that all these emission emitted photons as a result of stimulated emission can be in phase. So, that is a fundamental difference between a spontaneous emi spontaneously emitted photon and stimulated photons. So, in other words you can generate coherent light because of stimulated emission. The light emitted by LED is always incoherent. Now, a little bit more about the mathematics of the process. After you injected the carriers, the recombination rate, which means let us say n is your carrier density, which means number of carriers per unit volume, right? n represents number of carriers per unit volume. they recombine, the carriers recombine. The question you are asking is at what rate do they recombine? And that rate is like a radioactive decay. It is minus n by tau, dn by dt is minus n by tau. Minus indicates that it goes on reducing. Tau is the time constant of the system. Now, this time constant is decided by several factors. We will come to that in the next slide, which means that if I integrate this equation, I will get dn by n is dt by tau, which means its integration will give you something like this, n is equal to n naught, where this n naught is carrier density at t equal to 0. Right? Initially, when you started looking at this, is when you, the moment you injected, you had a carrier density n naught. But as time passes by, it decays, which means as and when the electron hole co combination recombination happens, the number of carrier density, the number of free carriers that are available for recombination will start getting reduced, and that is this time constant. The point is we understand that an electron in this state and a hole in this state recombines, giving rise to a photon. But it is not necessary that all the combinations, recombinations are giving rise to photons. Right? There may be recombinations which are not giving rise to photons. One needs to find out what is the fraction of recombinations that is giving rise to photons and what is the fraction which is not giving rise to photons. That tells you the 
efficiency of the system. You may be injecting carriers, but it will be useful only if all those or a large fraction of the injected carriers is giving rise to radiative recombinations. And also, there is no emission of photon in indirect band gap material. So, you cannot, that is why a regular silicon diode, you, you are sending a drive current, you are not seeing light out of the silicon diode. The reason is because in an indirect band gap material, you have a large difference in momentum. Achieve momentum uh, conservation is not an easy task, which is why indirect band gap materials will not result in emission, which is why in your undergraduate laboratory, you take a PN junction diode, your um, you know silicon diode, you are sending current, you are doing several rectifiers and uh, you know different operations with a diode, you never see light coming out of the diode. Not because the material is not transparent, it is because it is an indirect band gap material. Okay. Now, let us get back to this radiative and non-radiative recombinations. Right? So, radiative recombinations are those recombinations where the electrons and holes recombine to emit photons. So, we said the recombinations could be radiative, it could be non-radiative. So, let us define the recombination lifetime. So, n is equal to you had n naught e power minus t by tau. I say tau r is the recombination lifetime of the radiative part. The corresponding recombination rate is n by tau r, dn by dt is n by tau r in this case. And non-radiative recombinations are those where the electrons and holes recombine to emit phonons, not photons. Now, phonons are uh, discrete units of thermal vibrations. They are not invisible, which means you could have a transition between, uh, let us say, a state here and there could be a defect state here because of some defects in the way the semiconductor is manufactured. Right? So, you could have transitions to defect states. You could have transitions where an electron is and the hole is recombining, but the energy is given to another electron and that another electron reaches a further excited state. The other electron actually gains kinetic energy of the system out of this out of the whole process. That phenomenon is called as auger recombination. Right? There could be other several non-radiative recombination mechanisms because of which at the end of the day we are not getting light out of the system. So, a useful metric is to find out to define recombination uh, rate, this is non-radiative recombination rate as n by tau r and the corresponding lifetime is tau n r. Now, as we know the non-radiative recombination rate is going to reduce the efficiency of the system. So, what is the measure? How do I now quantify the efficiency of the system? So, you define quantum efficiency of the system what is called as the internal quantum efficiency of the system, which is nothing but the ratio of the radiative recombination rate divided by the total recombination rate. Now, I substitute RR as n by tau r divided by n by tau r plus n by tau n r. I substitute this, I get this tau n r divided by tau r plus tau n r. Okay? So, we talked about valence band, conduction band, we talked about recombinations which gives rise to photons, then we talked about the fact that all recombinations may not give rise to photons. So, the fraction of recombinations that are giving rise to photons is your internal quantum efficiency. Now, this non-radiative recombination is temperature dependent because larger is the temperature, more probability of photon emission. Right? So, this is a temperature dependent quantity. Another useful parameter here is carrier lifetime, which means this n by tau that we talked about is now actually a combination of radiative and non-radiative recombination time. So, you define 1 by tau carrier lifetime, a fraction of it due to radiative and a fraction of it due to non-radiative. 